Hello, my name is Arnold Delorme, and this presentation is about finding the best EEG preprocessing pipeline. Who wants to spend their time cleaning and processing EEG data? What is the optimal way, by the way, of processing EEG data? In the era of super smart AI, haven't we figured out what frequency to filter the data on how to best reject artifacts? This video tries to answer some of these questions. There are different steps for EEG preprocessing. First, importing the data, filtering it, re-referencing it, and then rejecting artifacts. If you want to look at ERPs, you may extract data epochs, reject bad data epochs, and remove baseline activity. We will look at each step, but before we start, let's examine the methodology used to assess the best preprocessing pipeline. The most difficult to find an optimal preprocessing pipeline is to find a metric to optimize. What do we want to achieve? Mr. Delorme, Mr. Delorme. Yes, me from the past. But it's super easy. I just need a pipeline that makes my results significant. And then I can publish my paper. Bingo. That's not the way I would have phrased it, but we want a pipeline that maximizes statistical significance when comparing conditions of interest. Here you see the general method we designed. For each subject, we apply a preprocessing step, then we extract epochs for two conditions, and of course that depends on the experiment, then we count the number of significant channels. To be able to create confidence intervals, we randomly select 50 trials for each condition repetitively. This is indicated here by bootstrap. The rationale for using the percentage of significant channels is that because of volume conduction, an effect will be visible on most channels, even if it's localized in one brain area. It is illustrated here. We have a brain source and its potential is visible on most channels. So we will try different pre-processing steps and see how this affects the percentage of channels which are significant. We will try filtering the data, re-referencing the data, and using different methods to reject artifacts. Let's also briefly review the free experiments we will use. We use data from free public datasets, a go-no-go -no -go task, a face categorization task, and an oddball task. If you're not a scientist, this might sound so weird, right? Anyway, that's what we do. For each experiment, we compare two conditions. In the first go-no-go -no -go experiment, participants saw photographs one at a time and press a button whenever they saw an animal. This is shown here. We compared the ERPs for animals and distractors. When we looked at the ERPs, we picked the range 350 to 450 milliseconds as the one where the difference between animals and distractor trials had the highest number of significant channels. Here about 50% of the channels were significant, although that varied across subjects as shown by the red shaded area. The second task is a popular face categorization dataset available online. In this one, we compared familiar faces versus scrambled faces, as shown here. The maximum number of significant channels was in the 250 to 350 time range. We will call this task the face task. Finally, we use EEG data from an editory oddball task. So imagine beep, beep, boop, beep. And the task of the subject is to press a button on the boobs only. Here is how it sounds. The beep sounds are frequent and they're called standards. The boop sounds are rare and called oddballs. In this kind of oddball task, we usually observe a difference between the ERPs of oddball and standards. Here we looked at all the channels and so that in between 400 and 500 milliseconds, about 50% of the channels were significant. We will call this task the oddball task. Not that all the data from all three experiments were acquired in different conditions. 
The Go No Go uses a Neuroscan amplifier and a CZ reference. The Face data set uses an EEG system of a Neuromag MEG machine and the Outboard data set uses a Biosymbi amplifier. So now we're ready to see how pre-processing affects the outcome. Basically, which pre-processing step maximizes the difference between the pairs of condition in each task? When you import data, you usually have to filter it. If you do not, you can have large offsets. So ignoring all other parameters is very an optimal filter. Here, we will only look at the high pass filter. So in this plot, I show you the difference between no filtering, except for analog or digital filtering performed during data acquisition, and 0.01 Hertz is the cutoff frequency that the authors of the ERP Lab software package recommend for ERP analysis. For this point, for example, which represents one subject in the go-no-go -no -go task, we increase by 70% the percentage of significant channels by high-pass filtering the EEG at 0.01 Hertz. Now, on the other axis, we see that the baseline percentage of significant channel is 7%. So for this data set, we multiply by 10 the percentage of significant channels. Here I show the other data sets as well as the standard error. On average, we multiply by 4 the number of significant channels. Now let's look at other filters uh, cutoff frequencies. We can see that for the go no go task, the optimal filter is about 0.5 Hz, and it is dramatically better than 0.01 Hz more than doubling the number of significant channels. For the phase task, the increase in significance is not as large. However, this task had a high pass filter at 0.1 Hz during the data acquisition. For the oddball task, we see a similar effect as with the go-no-go -no -go task, with the optimal cutoff frequency at 0.5 Hz. What about filter implementation? Does it matter if you use ERP Lab, EG Lab, MNE, Brainstorm, or Fieldtrip? This is shown here for the Outball datasets, and the other datasets have a similar story. All filters are compared with the ERP Lab filter. You can see that EG Lab and Fieldtrip do not affect significance, even though these are different types of filters. Fieldtrip and ERP Lab are Butterworth filters and EEG lab is the linear fill filter. MNE and brainstorm filters show slightly decreased significance. This could be due to a filter implementation or filter roll-off, meaning the rate of change of the output of the filter versus frequency. But it's good to see that the filters seem comparable across software packages. In all subsequent analysis, we high pass filtered the data at 0.5 Hz with the EEG lab filter. Then we tried line noise removal. We tried different methods, the clean line EEG plugin, which estimates and removes sinusoidal line noise, and the Zapline Plus EEG lab plugin, which combines spectral and spatial filtering to remove line noise. Neither of these helped. What helped, however, was to reject channels that contain too much line noise. For example, rejecting all channels with more than three standard deviations in the line noise frequency significantly increase the significance for the face and oddball datasets. However, it wasn't by much. So the take home message here is not to be obsessed with line noise removal techniques unless you have a specific reason for that then an important pre-processing step is re-referencing. I'm not going to enter the details here because I have an entire video about what's the best reference. To summarize, we found that no reference was systematically better. Surprisingly, compared to the hardware reference, re-referencing, including average reference and the infinity reference, does not seem to increase the number of significant channels. Then the next step is, of course, artifact rejection. But is it fair to randomly pick 50 trials for each condition? The answer is no, it's not fair. The real question is whether the significant increases 
after we rejected the trials, considering all the trials. So without picking 50 trials for each condition. So for all analysis removing data, we considered all the trials. Does removing artifact help? As we will see, and as crazy as it sounds, in almost all cases, the answer is no. It is not better to reject artifacts because even though you remove artifacts, you also remove data and decrease the statistical power. We try different methods in different software. The good news is that for MNE, Field Trip, and Brainstorm, there are not that many automated methods available yet to automatically reject artifacts. So it was relatively easy to test. For each method, we try to scan the parameter space to find the best parameter for data rejection. Let's start with MNE. There was only one method we could find, which was the auto reject plugin. This method rejects data trials and is completely automated. We observe no increase in significance when we use this method. For brainstorm, we use one method to remove low frequency artifacts, another one to remove high frequency artifacts, and one for the final pruning of single trial ERPs. We only had an increase in uh, significance when we used the least sensitive threshold of five for rejecting low frequency artifacts in the go no -Go dataset. None of the other rejections help with any of the other parameters we tested. We also realized that these methods were not tailored for EEG, as they were originally designed for MEG. And even for the least sensitive threshold of five, all the trials of some of the subjects were removed. Then we tried the only method for automated rejection available in Field Trip, which is based on Z-score threshold, here in the low and high frequency band. I invite you to look at the Field Trip website for more details. For the go no go data set, we observed a 3% increase in the number of significant channels with a z-score threshold of 5 for high frequency artifacts, but we did not observe any other improvement for other data sets. Finally, we tested different methods in EEG Lab. Unlike the other software we tested, we had to choose because there are 34 plugins in EEG Lab to reject artifacts. We focused on the default methods included in the core EEG Lab distribution. First, EEG Lab allows the detection of bad channels based on their correlation with each other. A channel that is not correlated with others is likely an artifact. We have found that removing channels correlated less than 95% for the face and 97% for the outball data set increased significance. However, the 97% threshold also removed 30% of the channels on average. So it's not realistic to use it in practice. Then we try detecting and removing bad portions of data using artifact subspace reconstruction, also known as ASR. Not that there are two ways to use ASR, one where you correct the data and one where you remove it. Here, we remove the bad data. ASR did not increase significance. Finally, we use independent component analysis and an automated method to label and remove artifactual components. The IC label plugin returns the likelihood of a component to be an artifact in different categories. We try different threshold values for removing eye artifacts and muscle artifacts. For example, when we set the probability of having muscle or eye components above 50% or 60%, we observed a modest improvement for some data sets. However, 50% is a low confidence threshold that would probably not be used in practice where we would typically use values of 80% or above. Here we summarize the result in this table. This table is the reason why the title of the paper describing these results is EEG is better left alone. Artifact rejection methods do not make much difference in terms of the significance of standard EEG data. And this is for EEG data acquired in laboratory conditions. The story might be different for EEG data acquired when the subject moves. It does not make any sense though. It is obvious that some of these algorithms work well at removing artifacts. The reason almost no method increased the number of significant channels is that as you remove data, 
you lose some trials, which means you lose statistical power. Even though it can be shown that after data cleaning, the remaining trials have fewer artifacts, we also have fewer trials and less statistical power. After cleaning data, we usually extract ERPs and sometimes perform baseline subtraction. How does baseline subtraction affect significance? This is perhaps one of the biggest surprises of this analysis, that subtracting baseline activity decreases significance. We have an entire video on this subject. Finally, based on the result of filtering and re-referencing and the table where we found the optimal data cleaning parameters, we tried the optimal pipelines for each of the software. EGLab performed significantly better overall, although the performance varied across datasets. However, the increase in the number of significant channels was modest at best. You might argue that we optimize more, more parameters for EEG labs, so it makes sense that it would perform best. We also try all software using the default parameters, which were actually almost the same as the parameters used uh, for the optimal pipeline. We observe similar results with the EEG lab pipeline performing the best. We think the main reason for the superiority of the EEG lab pipeline are the rejection of noisy channels and the modest improvement brought by ICA. I put a link in the description for a GitHub repository containing optimal EEG pipelines for EEG lab, brainstorm, MNE, and field trip. How does this compare to the literature? There has been other efforts, and I especially want to mention the multiverse analysis method. No, it's not that kind of multiverse. In this approach, the author tried different types of pre-processing, for example, varying the filtering, eye movement correction method, reference, baseline, how ERP is measured, etc. The analysis is illustrated here for two variables, the eye movement correction method, which were ICA and regression analysis, as well as references, which were mastoid or average reference. The measure can be anything but it could be, for example, the amplitude of ERPs. You can see that the first subject has four measures, one for each type of eye movement correction method and reference. Then it is the same for subject two. And of course, there are more subjects, 298 in their case. The analysis is then similar to running a two-way ANOVA with these two columns as the categorical independent variable and this one as the dependent variable. We then get the effect of each variable, as well as the interaction of the two variable if we want to. In other words, does each variable has an effect on the amplitude of, the, of an ERP? In the real analysis, they had more than two categorical variables. They had seven, and each subject does not have four rows, but 3,456. So this is called a mixed model. So the authors run this statistical model, and what did they find? I'm only showing you here a subset of the variable. They found that for an ERP called the ERN or event-related negativity, a high pass filter at 0.01 Hertz with a mastoid reference helped maximize the ERP amplitude. Using ICA or the regression method to remove eye artifact did not matter. They tested more than the ERN amplitude. They also tested the standard deviation across trials the idea is that the lower the standard deviation, the fewer the outliers and the better the preprocessing. In that case, they found that the best filter was 0.1 Hertz, which was the highest possible cutoff frequency they tested. They also found that ICA was better than regression and that the best reference was the average reference. They also tested the amplitude and standard deviation of the error positivity, or PE, which is another ERP, and found comparable results. Overall, the high-pass filter with the highest frequency seemed preferable to reduce trial difference. So all of these results are somewhat different from our results, right? Actually, not so much. In their analysis, the only reference were mastoid and average reference. And ourselves, we did not find that average reference was superior to mastoid. Also, the 0.01 Hertz filter superiority was only for ERP amplitude. Now, if you watch my video on the optimal ERP baseline, 
you know that the ERP amplitude has little physiological meaning. When they looked at ERP amplitude difference between condition, 0.1 Hz was either superior or uh, the difference between filters was not significant. So I would say that the results are consistent with ours. We found 0.5 Hz superior to 0.1 Hz, but 0.1 Hz was the highest uh, cutoff frequency they tested. This paper also illustrates that there does not seem to be a magical recipe that works in all cases. It is consistent with our results that most data pre-processing method do not have a dramatic impact on ERP statistical results. Now, new analysis are coming up by myself, as well as my colleague, Cyril Pernet in Copenhagen. He mentioned it's gonna be pretty fancy, so I'm really looking forward to that personally. That's it for this presentation, and thank you for your attention.